Okay, I'm really, really excited about today's video because I'm at one of my favorite places in the world, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. This is arguably one of the best museums in the entire world. The Louvre in Paris, France, perhaps being a little bit above it, but this is almost always in second place, sometimes first. This museum is incredible. It spans over 5,000 years of history. It has 2 million square feet and over 2 million works of art. Today, I'm going to show you the top 10 works of art in New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Let's go. Setting out to the Metropolitan Museum of Art from lovely Bushwick. This is my dear friend Brandon. I'm not sure if he would call me a dear friend, but we'll just... <laughs> so what's it like living in the most hip neighborhood in all of New York City? Very expensive. Yes? Even for you? Not for me. <laughs> how did you describe how Bushwick has changed over the years that you've lived here? Drastically. Drastically? Yes. Like what's different about this scene? What, what would have looked different here? Like. 10 years ago. Williamsburg is bleeding into Bushwick. So do you feel like Bushwick is part of your identity as a New Yorker or are you more of like an overall New Yorker? I think I'm, I mean, I've lived in pretty much every borough except for the Bronx and Staten Island. Which is your favorite? Manhattan. Okay, so we're gonna take the Metro to the Metropolitan Museum of Art all the way in Manhattan. How much is one way Metro ticket now in New York City? $2.75. $2.75. Okay, great. That will literally get you from the tippy top of the Bronx to Staten Island. Right. Just as long as it's the, on the same trip. Same trip. But that's how much, like, add, add the weekly pass around. that I just bought for $33 is the same amount as a monthly pass in Budapest. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. A month? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Okay, I'm so excited to be in here. I can barely contain my excitement, but I'm not gonna be loud because there's a lot of people trying to enjoy these epic works of art like this one. We've just entered the museum and the greatest news is it costs $30 to get in, but if you're a New York State resident, you get to bring a guest for free. So if you have a friend who lives here in New York, you get to basically pay what you want. So we made a donation instead. I'm so excited to be in here. So let's get started looking at the top 10 works here in this world-class museum. Coming in at number 10 is a work by a female artist. 1787, Elizabeth Louise Viget Lebrun. She was a self-taught painter, and what's so impressive about this work, which is actually of her daughter, is the nearly impossible perspective that she has when she's looking in the mirror at herself. Elizabeth had to flee France because she was friends with Marie Antoinette, but that friendship with Marie Antoinette was actually what got her into some of the better academies that allowed her to end up creating works like this. Welcome to number 10. Welcome to number nine. These paintings sure do span the breadth of size and style. I'm gonna walk from one end of this pollock to the other just to show you how huge it is. This is an example of what's called drip painting. Now what's interesting is it looks really, really abstract, but this was painted, I believe, in 1957. It's called Out of Colors, Jackson Pollock, the famous American painter. But he says that he was influenced by muralists. He believed that the movement was towards murals. So this is meant to be kind of an extension of that thinking. 
and to have some sort of movement, an emotional movement, as you're watching it. So make of that what you will. Number nine, Jackson Pollock. Is it, you said this was your favorite piece? No, because I think I could do that. <laughs> you think you could do that? That brilliant orange? <laughs> do you know how long it took him to decide to go like upward and to the left? I mean, just give me an oversized orange magic marker. Like... You think so highly of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you call that an orange magic marker? <laughs> She's probably still alive. That was painted in 1969. Actually, I created something like this in missing the, um, Eleanor's... When you were five? Kindergarten class. <laughs> Doing arts and crafts. Is that how you've been able to afford living in New York? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Coming in at number eight, we're going to take a step back to 1565. What's really important about this work, this is, this is painted by Peter Bruegel the Elder, and it's a scene of a hot summer day in the Netherlands. But for, for 1565, what's really significant is the shift from images of religious iconography, which would have been probably commissioned by the church, to humanism and scenes of everyday life. Imagine that, almost 500 years ago, we're having a focus on peasants. You can see facial expressions of real world people. You see a woman here who's probably been cutting wheat all day, eating probably some sort of porridge from a bowl. And another really beautiful thing, just personally I love here, is the church in the background. The perspective is really wonderful. You can see the blue roof of the church and the kind of scraggly branches going in front of it. Considering its time period, a really impressive work of art, an impressive work in the history of art as well, to have here in the Museum of Metropolitan. Welcome to number seven. For those of you who know me, you'll know that Caravaggio is one of my favorite artists. Unfortunately, another great work they have here at the Metropolitan Museum by Caravaggio, it's called The Musicians, it's not available to be seen. But this wonderful work is. This is The Denial of St. Peter. It's from 1610, and it's one of the later works of Caravaggio. So what was Caravaggio known for? Well, beyond the realisticness of the painting, he was known for what's called chiaro scuro, which basically in Italian means light and dark. If you take a look at this painting, you're gonna see how that contrast pretty much creates the emotion. Why do we need to create that emotion? Because we're telling a really important story that was central not only to people like Caravaggio, but to the people that would sponsor art at the time, which were usually churches and other types of religious institutions or religious people. So this important story is the denial of St. Peter. Peter is accused of being a follower of Christ three times in the Bible. Here that's symbolized by the woman's two fingers and the man's one finger. Being up close to this work is something that you can't really recreate on the camera. Because of his use of that chiaroscuro technique, so much of it can only barely be seen. For example, the soldier. And of course, the light is shining on the face of the disciple, Peter. Coming in at number six, is this work of Madonna and Child by Raphael, one of the four Renaissance artists that was made into a Ninja Turtle, which some of you probably are familiar with. This is one of the oldest works in our top 10, coming in at number six. It's from 1506, the Renaissance, when things really started to change for European art. You start to see more realistic facial expressions, and pretty much everyone in this work of art has that, that change from the medieval times to the Renaissance, where you start to see the softness of the eyes, the eyebrows, the cheeks. This is the only work by Raphael that exists in the entire United States. You have to come to the Metropolitan Museum of Art here to see it. These wrinkles around the eyes and in the forehead for 520 some years ago are incredible. Now the baby, I wouldn't say they got quite accurate because it looks like an adult face. <laughs> but that was common for the art at the time. The halos were obligatory. Okay, keeps getting better and better. Welcome to number five. You already know who this is. This is one of your favorite painters. This is Claude Monet. This was painted in 1889. 1889 on the property that he bought in Giverny. 
And the most beautiful thing about this is the contrast between the pink of the lilies and the green grass foliage. But I don't need to say very much about Monet. I think the work speaks for itself. Clocking in at number five. Okay, so for number four, I'm gonna start at the epic Temple of Dendur and take you over to an Egyptian sphinx. This is called the Sphinx of Hatshepsut, and it's an image of a female pharaoh combined with a lion and a bull's tail. It's actually a recreation because it was smashed into so many pieces by her successor. But here it is for us today, recreated as the number four top site. It's the only sculpture on our list in this epic Egyptian section of the Metropolitan Museum. This one still has its nose, apparently unlike the largest sphinx outside the Pyramid of Giza. Human face, lion's body, and a bull's tail, symbolizing masculinity. This epic painting comes in at number three, and it's really spectacular. Look at the breadth of this. This is a depiction of George Washington crossing the Delaware River in one of the most pivotal battles of the U.S. Revolution. It's probably the most reproduced work in the history of art that celebrates American patriotism. It wasn't painted at the time of the Revolutionary War. It was painted more than 100 years after, almost 100 years after. But it is an incredible work really rousing in patriotism and in its detail and one of the most massive works of art that you can see in a museum. Right? You can see the chunks of ice as it was frozen river. 1776 was when this event took place around Christmas time. And it changed the history of the war and the world. Right now I'm standing in front of another painting in the American Wing. This was actually painted at the time of Indians in a gorge on an expedition that the painter went with the uh, explorers. I could literally spend all day in just the American Wing of this fantastic museum. Coming in at number two, one of my personal favorites in the entire canon of art history. This is The Death of Socrates, painted by Jacques-Louis David. The year is 1787. Jacques-Louis David was probably the most prominent representative of the neoclassical movement, which is what you can see here in this almost picture-like sheet. It doesn't mean much to you unless you know the story of what's going on here, but it's really one of the most fascinating stories in history and in philosophy as well. The central character here is Socrates, the philosopher. And it looks like he's speaking around a group of peoples. He is surrounded by his peoples, but he's actually about to die. He's going to drink the poison, which is hemlock, in that cup. 
because he's sentenced to death for corrupting the youth by making them think. And other things, probably. Really one of the most glorious works in the history of art. Right here at number two in the Metropolitan Museum. There are so many magnificent works in this museum that creating a top 10 list is nearly impossible. So I have to throw in some honorable mentions, and this one is much more than honorable. This is a Picasso, and it's a painting of Gertrude Stein. For those of you who don't know who Gertrude Stein is, she was actually critical in him becoming successful. She was an American, well, went back and forth between the US and France, and she had a salon, like a living room for artists in Paris, where she would select and uplift or destroy the reputations of many artistic people. Something else that's really important about this work is that this is in a transitionary period for Picasso, so he's subtly moving into Cubism. Here we have an honorable mention in our top 10 lists. You can't skip a Degas. This is Degas' depiction of a dance class filmed in Paris. What I find most striking and interesting about it, if you're not interested particularly in the dance world, which he very much was, is the angle. So take a look at that line. The line and the perspective are what make this work. Degas' The Dance Class from 1874. This honorable mention is The Penitent Mary Magdalene by George de la Tour, one of my favorite subjects in world history and Bible history. Here you see Mary Magdalene with a skull on her lap. Why did people have skulls at the time? It was actually common to meditate with a skull because it was a reminder of mortality so that you could focus on what was beyond mortality, heaven, and the reunification with Jesus. Coming in at number one, just like in the Louvre Museum in Paris, the number one is the smallest. This is a small picture, but a breathtaking picture. This is Vincent van Gogh's self-portrait with a small hat, known for his hundreds of different brushstrokes that bring the liveliness right to the face and the straw hat. He painted himself because models were very expensive at the time, and he also painted very rural and normal day-to-day -day pictures. Not much needs to be said about Vincent van Gogh. It's so wonderful to see Van Gogh images that I just wanted to throw this in as a much more than honorable mention. I actually prefer Van Gogh's images of wheat fields, such as this one, wheat fields and cypresses, over his self-portraits. I mean, when I look at this, it's like looking at a hybrid between a picture and a work of art, and you almost feel like you're, you're flying upward and into it. The worst works of art here in the Metropolitan Museum of Art would be works that are in the top 10 of any other museum. I love this creation of the world. Wow, what an incredible experience and what an incredible museum. 
Something that you should really know about this museum, since it's pretty much the greatest museum in the world, like I said, besides maybe the Louvre, I feel like in order to absorb it, unless you're gonna do a top 10 blitz like we did today, you almost need an entire day, I would say, or an afternoon per section. I personally could have spent a whole afternoon in the American wing. I could have spent a whole afternoon in half of the European paintings wing. I could have spent a whole afternoon in the Egyptian wing. So I really recommend if you have a little bit more time in New York, come and absorb some of the wonderfulness that this museum really has to offer. I mean, I wasn't even considering using these works of art in this video. We were just looking for a cool location to shoot the closer. And here I am with an El Greco, who I love, on both sides of me, especially this painting. One of the things that I've personally noticed that I think is something else that may resonate with you as well, is that in today's digital age, where we're constantly on our phones and we're constantly bombarded with imagery and pictures and all sorts of stimulation, it actually has developed within me a greater appreciation for still works of art. So it's a really wonderful experience coming to a museum like this and it almost makes me feel perhaps maybe it's almost as unique as it was for the people who didn't have any art at the time to come and see such lifelike images because when is the last time I've seen an image that wasn't either moving or altered or an advertisement or followed by 700 other images? The ability to stand and contemplate one thing for a while and to focus and to perhaps analyze and to feel is something that may be becoming lost in our modern age and something that you can really reconnect with in a wonderful museum like the New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. So thank you so much for watching. Please remember to click subscribe. All it does is it puts it in your little subscription feed so you don't have to go searching around for me when you wanna see more great videos. I also really love the interactiveness of YouTube, that it allows you to leave comments. So if you have a comment about something you liked, a comment about something you think I could do better, something that impacted you emotionally that maybe you just want to share, just leave it in the comments. I read all of them and I respond to almost all of them. So I'd love to see you show up there in the comment section. Thank you so much for coming to this wonderful place, one of my favorite places in the entire world, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I hope you enjoyed the top 10 and all of the honorable mentions. Thank you, Brandon, so much for coming with me and being my wonderful cameraman and side commenter through all of this. I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. See you next time.